Hello and welcome to the Fry Art Museum's virtual opening of Black Refractions, highlights from the Studio Museum in Harlem. My name is Alex Eiler and I am the membership and events manager at the Fry Art Museum. Tonight we are joined together from around the country and maybe even the globe. So let us know where you're joining us from and drop your location in the chat. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish and Squamish tribes, who have since time immemorial stewarded the lands and waters of this place we now call Seattle. Please join me in offering gratitude and respect to the elders past and present, as well as the future generations for their stewardship. Thank you. Tonight, we will be hearing from the people that have been a part of making this exhibition a reality. Joseph Rosa and Amanda Donnan of the Fry Art Museum, Thelma Golden and Connie Choi of the Studio Museum in Harlem, and Pauline Willis of the American Federation of the Arts. Without further ado, I'm thrilled to turn it over to Fry Director and CEO, Joseph Rosa. Thank you so much, Alex. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to celebrate the Fry Art Museum's opening of Black Refractions, highlights from the Studio Museum in Harlem. We are thrilled to bring this exhibition to the Fry and honored to be the last stop of the national tour organized by the American Federation of Arts and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Many, many thanks to Thelma Golden, director of the Studio Museum in Harlem, and Pauline Willis, director of the American Federation of Arts, for your vision and passion for sharing this extraordinary collection. I'm so happy that both of you are also with us virtually this evening. We'll also have the opportunity tonight to hear more about this exhibition from Studio Museum curator, Connie Choi, and our own chief curator, Amanda Donnan. I hope their insight inspires you to plan your visit to see this extraordinary exhibition. And finally, I'd like to thank our Fry members and supporters for all you do to make exhibitions like this possible. And to our amazing staff, a huge thanks for your energy and incredible work you've undertaken to present and share this transformative exhibition. And without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce Thelma Golden. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Joe, for your kind introduction. I'm Thelma Golden, Director and Chief Curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem. I am happy to virtually be here for the opening of Black Refractions on its last stop in an incredible nationwide tour. Black Refractions was organized as a way to share our collection while the Studio Museum is closed for construction of our new museum. Also, we saw it as an amazing way to share our mission and collection with new audiences. Despite the pandemic and all the related challenges, I'm so pleased to see the exhibition was able to make it to Seattle and excited to have people there see highlights from the Studio Museum in Harlem's collection. I want to thank Pauline Willis and the entire staff of the American Federation of Arts for their incredible work and support in organizing the travel of the exhibition and realizing the accompanying catalog. The AFA has gone above and beyond during this most unprecedented year to ensure the safety and care of the works in the exhibition and to navigate the challenges in rescheduling the presentations at the Fry Art Museum and the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. We have been grateful for the amazing response to the exhibition that it has received while it's been on the road. I would like to thank the entire Studio Museum in Harlem staff, especially Connie H. Choi, Associate Curator, Permanent Collection, and Curator of Black Refractions. Connie's commitment to the growth and scholarship around the museum's collection and her incredible commitment to stewarding this exhibition and amazing publication continue to inspire me. I do hope that you all enjoy hearing more from her this evening. Finally, I'm incredibly grateful to the entire team at the Fry Art Museum. Joe Rosa, director and CEO at the Fry Museum, my colleague and my friend. 
Amanda Donnan, chief curator who organized the Fry's presentation with David Strand, associate curator. The wonderful exhibition and registration team of Corey Gooch, chief registrar and head of collections, Laura Landau, manager of exhibitions and publications, Shane Montgomery, manager exhibition design and production, and Nevis Mistravic, assistant registrar. Michelle Cheng, Director of Education and Community Partnerships and her team for the thoughtful education and public programs around the exhibition. Ingrid Langston, Head of Communications and Content Strategy and Becky Cowles, Senior Director of Development. I do hope that you all will have a chance to see Black Refractions at the wonderful Fry Art Museum. Thank you all for joining us this evening and I do hope that you enjoy the conversation with Amanda and Connie. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Pauline Willis, Director and CEO of the American Federation of Arts. And I'm so pleased to be here virtually this evening. The AFA is thrilled to have the Fry host the culmination of Black Refractions Six Museum National Tour. It is indeed a testament to the importance of this exhibition and our wonderful partners like the Fry that we were able to maintain the full national tour despite the impact the pandemic has had on museums around the country. We are so happy to be here with you tonight at a moment when access to art has become even more important to our well-being. The American Federation of Arts has been a vital part of American cultural life for over 112 years. Our original mission to bring artworks to museums around the country remains steadfast today with her dedication to organizing traveling exhibitions, publishing scholarly catalogs, and developing educational programs that enrich countless lives. Black Refractions emerged from a long-standing dialogue between the AFA and the Studio Museum in Harlem about the possibility of working together and traveling an exhibition of the museum's wonderful collection, bringing its art and ideas to audiences throughout the country. The exhibition has brought visitors from a wide variety of backgrounds to our partner museums to see these works by artists of the African diaspora and to better understand their tremendous contributions to American art. Both access and education are core to the AFA's mission and we are thrilled to partner with the Studio Museum to realize these goals. So many important partnerships were formed to make this tour possible. I'm particularly grateful to Art Bridges for supporting this project so generously from the outset. Their foundational commitment helped make Black Refractions accessible to museums of all sizes through a transformational grant. We would like to also thank Pure Insurance for their generous support. Thank you to my colleague, Thelma Golden, for her passion and for her support of this project from the beginning, and to Connie Choi for carrying forward the curatorial vision of the collection. A huge thank you to the Fry Museum for hosting this final presentation of Black Refractions. And now I'm pleased to hand this off to Ana Amanda Donan, Chief Curator of the Fry Art Museum. Thanks, Pauline. We're at the Friar, so honored to be part of this momentous tour. And I'm just so grateful to have had the opportunity to work with uh, an incredible group of objects. Um, the exhibition inhabits most of the gallery space at the Fry, so it really does feel like a studio museum uh, takeover, uh, right down to the Glenn Ligon neon text piece that was made for the Studio Museum's entryway and is now the first thing that you see when you come into the Fry. And the show does look really fantastic. We just put the finishing touches on it uh, yesterday. So I want to echo Thelma's thanks to the registration and installation teams that really went the extra mile to make everything look superb. And now I want to introduce my esteemed curatorial colleague, Connie Choi, who um, selected the works in the exhibition from the Studio Museum's collection, uh, wrote much of the text, and has now overseen six layout and installation processes and participated in I don't know how many of 
this kind of program. Connie is the associate curator of the permanent collection at the Studio Museum in Harlem, where she's worked on prior exhibitions, including fictions regarding the figure and their own Harlems, which uh, parlayed into a section of this exhibition, as you'll see when you visit. And prior to joining the Studio Museum, Connie was uh, assistant curator of American art at the Brooklyn Museum. She has a PhD in art history from Columbia and a master's degree in arts education from Harvard. Connie's gonna fill in some background on the Studio Museum and the exhibition Black Refractions, and then I'll come back in to join her uh, in conversation about the show. If you have questions that you'd like to ask, you can drop them into the chat in the YouTube stream, and I'll check on that towards the end of our conversation uh, and relay those. Also note that Connie is going to give a more in-depth virtual walkthrough of the works in Black Refractions on June 23rd at 12 p.m. So you can find that event and register um, on our events calendar online. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Connie. I am so excited to be here with you all virtually to celebrate the opening of Black Refractions at the Fry Art Museum, although albeit sadly, we could not do it in person. Uh, we were actually in the midst of planning for the install um, a little over a year ago. Um, so this is truly a long time coming um, and I'm excited that these works will be on view in Seattle for the next three months. I'm going to be speaking briefly tonight about both the exhibition and the Studio Museum in Harlem's history and formation. This is really just meant to be a bit of a teaser um, as a way for you to go all go out and see Black Refractions in person at the Fry. I look forward to then being in conversation with Amanda afterwards about some of the things that I'll be discussing. So I will start my screen share now. And I would like to start here with this work that Amanda just mentioned, Glenn Ligon's Give Us a Poem, not only because it is the work that visitors will first encounter when they enter the exhibition, but also because it so poignantly speaks to a larger understanding of both the exhibition and the Studio Museum's mission. The text was taken from a 1975 speech by Muhammad Ali at Harvard University. Ali was asked by a student to give us a poem, to which he replied, me, we. Short and sweet, but incredibly poignant uh, and profound. These two words speak to both the collective action of many, as well as an individual's contribution to a whole. In a time defined in the US by the civil rights and black power movements and protests against the Vietnam War, Ali's poem eloquently summed up the struggles and tensions of the time. And it's something that hits, I think, quite close to home today as well. Ligon's work frequently uses text to critically examine US society and really sets the stage for the rest of the exhibition. The Studio Museum began as an idea in the mid 1960s at the height of the civil rights movement when people around the country and really around the world were demanding equality and social justice. I'm showing you here on the left, Lyndon B. Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, a major milestone in the struggle for equal rights. And on the right, nonviolent demonstrators, including the late Congressman John Lewis, being confronted by Alabama State Police in 1965 as they marched from Selma to Montgomery. The work by civil rights activists to shed light on and correct racial injustices was paralleled in the art world at the time. Beginning in the early 1960s, artists began forming collectives to advance the work of artists of African descent broadly. Groups such as Spiral and Kamange, of which you see a portrait here on the left, sought to provide access um, to resources, conversations, and support systems that many artists didn't necessarily have. Um, at the same time, many Black artists began to protest the discriminatory practices in the art world, and specifically within New York City institutions. Here on the right, you see the artist Norman Lewis in 1969 protesting outside the Metropolitan Museum of Art because of the exhibition Harlem on My Mind, which controversially um, excluded the work of Black artists aside from uh, photographers. These organizations and activities combined were re really brought about the genesis of the Studio Museum in Harlem. Born from an idea proposed by a diverse group of artists, community activists, and philanthropists, the Studio Museum champions and celebrates the work of artists of African descent. We always talk about how the museum speaks 
The museum's name speaks its mission, studio. The museum is an artist-driven institution where one of its three founding initiatives is the Artist in Residence program, a residency program that has played a catalytic role in advancing the work of visual artists of African and Afro-Latinx descent. Museum, we are a fine arts institution with a collection and exhibition program. And in Harlem, we are proudly located in Harlem, a neighborhood in Manhattan that has played such an important role in Black cultural life and artistic production perhaps most notably with the Harlem Renaissance in the early 20th century. I'm showing you here on the left an image of our original location, a second story loft on Fifth Avenue between 125th and 126th Street. And on the right, some of the museum's founders gathered in front of the entrance to the museum in celebration of opening night in September, 1968. While the Studio Museum didn't begin as a collecting institution, it quickly began to form an important, and dare I say the most important, coll public collection of works by artists of African descent. Black Refractions is truly a reflection of the commitment to building a collection that really speaks to the breadth of Black artistic production over the last century. When we first began conceiving of this exhibition in partnership with the American Federation of Arts, we wanted to create a checklist that was expansive and flexible so that institutions such as the Fry would be able to craft a story that they wanted to tell. It was important to us that artists working in the mid 20th century in and around the time of the museum's founding were foregrounded because they were so instrumental in advancing public recognition and understanding of the work of black, black artists broadly. You see here on the left, a painting by Betty Blayton Taylor, an artist who played a pivotal role in not only the museum's history, but New York City's cultural landscape. Blayton Taylor served as the museum's board secretary for over a decade, and she was in the group photograph um, you just saw on the previous slide. Her work, deeply invested in metaphysics, was also uh, interested in experimentation with techniques and materials in the creation of abstractions. On, on the right is Norman Lewis's Blue and Boogie. Uh, Lewis was an artist who was steeped in the conversations around abstract express expressionism, but who equally advocated for black artists and equity in the art world, as we saw in that earlier image of him protesting outside the Met. As we see with this work, Lewis and Blayton Taylor and other art artists in the exhibition were critical in advancing abstraction as an artistic practice. The importance of sight is another theme that you see throughout the exhibition. Harlem, as I mentioned earlier, has played a crucial role in Black artistic production since the early 20th century, with many across the arts continually inspired by the neighborhood. Here you see a photograph by Daoud Bey, who captured the daily lives of Harlem residents in the 1970s in the series Harlem USA. As he reacquainted himself with the neighborhood as a young person, Bay formed relationships with many of the people he encountered that he considered critical to his understanding of not only the neighborhood, but of a general um, practice. 40 years later, Jordan Castile also roots her practice in community engagement, spending time get getting to know the people whom she met in the neighborhood while she was in the museum's artist in residence program. Here you see Kevin the Kite Man, whom Castile would observe regularly from her studio window. In painting Kevin's portrait, Castillo gives visibility to the everyday person, ensuring that people of color are figured into the art historical canon. Castillo is one of over 100 artists who have participated in the museum's artist in residence program. Black Refractions includes works by many of these artists, including David Hammonds, Julie Moretu, Carrie James Marshall, and Kahinde Wiley, um, just to name a few, and represents all five decades of the program. You see here just three more works. On the left, Leroy Clark's 1970 painting, Now, a powerful proclamation in support of the worldwide independence movement of, of countries previously under colonial rule, including the artist's own country of Trinidad and Tobago, which achieved independence just eight years before Clark painted this work. In the middle, number 74 by Leonardo Drew, whose, work evoke whose works evoke memory and the passage of time with the inclusion of oxidized, weathered, and otherwise eroded objects. And you can see that primarily in the upper register of this work. Drew simultaneously is deeply invested in abstraction, seen here in the repet repetitive grid of boxes. And on the right, Jennifer Packer's Ivan, whose loose brushstrokes and a limited color palette of mauve invite the viewer to look closer, to examine, to think about what the artist is trying to convey. 
And I'll end uh, with just these two works here, Isaac Julian's Incognito on the left and Audubon and Conga's Houseboy on the right as a way to begin to think about a global conversation of, of, of black artistic production. While the Studio Museum's collection and as a result, Black Refractions does predominantly reflect the work of artists in the United States, both also include important examples of works by black, by artists working and living um, in both the Caribbean uh, as well as Europe and Africa. So I'd like to circle back to this idea of celebrating the individual and the collective as we saw with Ligon's Give Us a Poem. What I have enjoyed seeing, uh, albeit virtually, in this presentation of Black Refractions at the Fry is the ways in which the museum has really thought critically about not just the works and the artists in the exhibition, but about their collective import, as well as their audience, um, everyone here tonight. Um, I hope that you can all go see this exhibition for yourselves to see what Amanda and the Fry team have so beautifully installed in the galleries. Thank you so much. And I look forward to all of Amanda's questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Connie. I learn something new every time I hear you talk about this show. <laughs> um, what, what, what was the new thing you learned? Oh, I don't know. There's just always, you're bringing in new uh, archival images, for example, each time. And uh, I don't know, my understanding is just enriched each time. So thanks. Um, I think like one of the first things that comes to my mind when you talk about the moment of the museum's founding is the sort of parallelism to the moment that we're in. And, you know, it's the museum's 50th anniversary. It was recently in 2018 and you're now scaling up into this amazing new building designed by Sir David Adjay. Uh, you're gonna have a lot more space. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you talked a lot about this sort of importance of institution building in 1968 as black artists and activists and community leaders recognized how important it was to, you know, take the initiative to value, historicize, um, uh, collect their culture rather than waiting around for, you know, the established institutions to do so. Yeah. So now 50 years later, um, at a very politically charged moment um, with echoes of that 1968 struggle for civil rights, uh, the Studio Museum is, you know, scaling up into this new building. Um, it demonstrates the success of the sort of culturally specific approach that was taken and the need for it. Um, and, but the, the broader art world has sort of taken steps recently to try to like catch up. It's not a, a finished project by any means, as we all know. Um, but can you talk about, uh, your sort of understanding about how the studio museum's mission has evolved or sort of taken on new meaning uh, relative to this moment in history or like what the role of a culturally specific institution is right now? I know it's a it's a big question, but I mean, I think, you know, the works in our collection are so amazing. And I and again, I'm just going to keep telling people to go see the show in person because you really do have to see these works in person. Um, because they speak across time, across, you know, geography, across, um, you know, I, I don't even know, across everything. Um, in a way that allows people to approach the works where they're at and also to think about where they can go, right? And so I think what is so amazing about the way in which um, you um, have organized the show, but um, other venue curators have organized the show is to think about your community, your audience, right? And how you envision your own audiences um, moving through the space um, and interacting with these works. And it, it allows for um, richer conversations as a result because you say you learn something new every time you hear me speak. I learn something new every time I see this exhibition installed. You know, every time a curator um, is thinking about these works and seeing pairings or juxtapositions that I didn't see, it makes me think about the work anew. You know, it makes me think about the artist practice anew in a way that um, is just really refreshing and and really reinvigorating in terms of, um, you know, 
calling to mind why art is important and why we do what we do and why we appreciate art. And I think that has been so amazing to see in this moment in particular, right? When we have been shut in uh, for the most part, when we have been um, kind of, you know, a hermit as I have been largely, um, to think about art as a way to open up doors and conversations again. And, you know, we always speak about how work, um, artwork in particular can be so reflective of a moment, um, but it's a moment in perpetuity, right? It's a, there's a way in which we can understand not only the way, the, the moment in which the work was created, but the struggle in general over centuries of black artistic production, right? And how artists have, um, have worked through ideas and conversations and tensions that have existed um, throughout this kind of longer lineage of artistic production. Um, and, you know, I am sad, I'm truly sad that this is the last venue because the, the show has allowed me to think more deeply about not only the collection, but also a history, um, a history that is only now really being told and seen by a broader audience. Um, and so we're really grateful, you know, to you for, for hosting us um, and this exhibition at the Fry. We feel lucky to do so. Um, well, I mean, the exhibition certainly attests to the Studio Museum's early and sort of consistent support for artists who are now, you know, getting big retrospective ex exhibitions at the Whitney and other, um, you know, big establishment institutions. So, um, but pulling together a show like this is a huge undertaking and traveling it um, is another thing altogether. And of course you were assisted by AFA with the travel logistics. Um, Thank you, you so much again, AFA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, yeah. But you made a, the curatorial decisions, you know, early on. And I mean, I guess that must have been like four years ago now at this point, um, because the tour was interrupted and delayed by COVID shutdowns, of course. So, I mean, it's kind of distantly in the rear view now, but I'd love to hear about your process, your thought process, you know, in winnowing this collection of um, over 2,000 objects, as I understand, down to about 100 yeah. to tour, tour to all these different sorts of spaces. And you touched on this a little bit in your in your presentation, but. Um, yeah. yeah, it took us, you know, I started at the museum in February, 2017 and, and Thelma Golden <laughs> told me right away that I would be working on this show. Um, and it took about a year to finalize the checklist because as you can imagine, every work is important and amazing and, and needs to be seen. Um, and there was a lot of back and forth and conversation with Marjorie King, um, former curator at the AFA about uh, this exhibition. What we knew um, from the very start and which something that Thelma articulated from the very beginning was that this exhibition had to be flexible, right? Um, there is no one understanding or one narrative of quote unquote black art. It doesn't exist, right? And so what we wanted this exhibition to do is really allow each venue to customize it to, you know, again, as I said, you know, your own um, desires, your own audiences. Um, and what we ended up doing was um, putting, you know, a cap in terms of um, the chronology or the, the time span of the exhibition. Our collection starts with works from the early 19th century, um, but we um, decided to really start the show in the 1920s as a way to think about a century of artistic production and as a way too to ground it as kind of thinking about critically about the 1920s in terms of the Harlem Renaissance and really the flourishing of black cultural production at that time. Um, and again, thinking about Harlem as a site that was so important for that. So that was a way to, reduce the checklist somewhat or to cut some works a little bit. Um, but then too, again, like I, I am someone who is really nerdy about institutional history. Um, and as someone who is new to the museum, it was a way for me to really dive in, um, both in learning the collection, but also in learning the, the museum, right? It has such a rich history um, that has now been told a couple times by, by a variety of scholars, but it's something that, um, 
a lot of people maybe don't know. Um, and so I wanted um, this exhibition to also tie deeply to the institution's history and its exhibition history. So as you'll see, as um, Amanda has organized, um, the exhibition takes you through really important aspects of the, the museum's history. So again, the artist in residence program as being so foundational to our understanding of um, the institution, but also to the role of black artists out in the world today, right? Um, there are so many artists who um, began as emerging artists in, in the museum's residency program. And so we are so proud and lucky to have works by them in our collection and also early works by them in our collection. Um, an exhibition series that that um, started in um, the early 2000s um, of F shows, um, shows of emerging artists of African descent um, that really pushed the boundaries of how we thought of um, of black artistic production kind of over the past 20 years. Um, thinking about Harlem as a site, you know, again, um, I lived in Harlem um, for almost eight years, and so the the notion of community and neighborhood was so important to me and I wanted that to be reflected in the show in a way not necessarily you know obliquely although there is a section called their own Harlems but you see that throughout the checklist right not just in the works in that section but artists who are really investigating place and site and community and people right in, in a way that that grounds our understanding of um the importance of community, right? Not just artistic communities, but communities in general. Um, and what I found so poignant, which um, you know, we we stated in the section text for their own Harlems, is that um, Jacob Lawrence encouraged people to find their own Harlems wherever they were, right? This idea that Harlem doesn't exist as a physical site only; it exists as a way of being, as a way of living in the world as a way of finding your own community of peers of people um and that was really so poignant to me like poetic to me right and thinking about how artists um particularly black artists have needed to to find their own support systems right and and again thinking about the the moment of the institution's history um all of those artist collectives that started in the 1960s not just spiral and kamange but also weusi and where we at and like any number of other collectives um because it is about it's about community it's about supporting each other in a way to advance a larger goal um and so that was another aspect of the checklist that um, that was critical for me. Um, and then finally, one of the things that um, Marjorie um, um, was really keen on was in thinking again, going back to the artist in residence program, thinking about how artists have developed their practice over time. Um, and so including kind of um, it, when we could later works by artists who were in the um, artist in residence program. So you see, um, you can see multiple works by David Hammonds, by Kehinde Wiley, um, and a, a couple other artists that really show the growth of their practice from perhaps around the time of their residency into kind of the present. Um, and that I think was an amazing um, addition to the checklist in terms of, again, so, uh, thinking about how we support artists over the course of their careers um, and thinking about how artists are constantly growing themselves, right? Um, and so to see that within an exhibition context was, was a, a great um, addition. Well, speaking of being like an institutional history nerd, or I mean, an institutional insider nerd, maybe is like, uh, were there favorites of yours that you had to cut because they couldn't travel? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm always, you know, like traveling a show is such a specific thing. And there's so many logistical conservation yeah. concerns that you have to take into account when you're, um, especially a six venue, like multi year situation. So I don't know if I should list them off. There are so, there are so many works that we um, couldn't include, um, most of them for conservation reasons. Um, as you mentioned, you know, it was a pretty grueling tour in terms of um, six venues. The install and deinstall um, takes its toll. Um, there were, you know, um, maybe I'll mention one. Beverly Buchanan. Um, there was a sculpture by Be Beverly Buchanan that I wanted to include in the collection, but it is very fragile. Um, and um, it 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 would have been it would we would have 
not done our responsibility as a steward of the work by traveling it, which is unfortunate. Um, but on the other hand, um, Buchanan's work has had so much interest that there is, you know, there are there have been multiple exhibitions in the time of um, Black Refractions run. So people have been um, exposed to her work in in a broad um, and really uh, fruitful way. Um, so there was a lot of conversations in that way as well, you know, within, um, you know, different artists too. Um, we went back and forth in which was the right work to include, not there, that there is one right work, but, you know, when we have a, um, a depth in the collection by artists, um, you know, they're, they're it's difficult. It's not easy to cut down, right? They're all amazing works, and so um, part of that too was uh, was in thinking about um, what stories would resonate the most with audiences. Um, and also, we didn't quite have the venue set yet, but we we did know somewhat or have um, some understanding of what some of the venues would be. So, in thinking about how this work would travel or how the show would travel around the country. Um, what works would be perhaps also um, surprising or new to audiences, right? What what we could do to broaden the conversations about um, the work of Black artists um, in a way that um, would be interesting to folks, right? Um, in a way that would expand our, our understanding of what the canon actually is. Yeah, well, I was glad you mentioned the sort of interpretive strategy that focuses on the institutional history. So that you, you basically had to conceive an exhibition and then you conceive two exhibitions within that exhibition, like two ways to slice it basically. You had a set of section texts um, and groupings that were more vaguely like thematic, more open um, related to materials and uh, things like this. And then the institutional tack, which we chose to take, which I think, as you mentioned, is helpful in keeping the Studio Museum in Harlem's sort of lens on Black art very present because, yeah, as you mentioned, it's an, a very diverse, um, the African diaspora is very diverse and you can't sum it up uh, neatly. But I wonder um, what you learned in that process or like <laughs> what that was like developing these two separate shows um, and sort of letting go a little bit of how it would turn out in these other venues or which uh, way people would go with it. I actually quite enjoyed it um, because it, because there were no rules then in a lot of ways, right? Like we formed the exhibition checklist without really, without at all thinking about a, a thematic structure. Um, it was truly just the works that we like felt um, had to be in the show to tell as complete um, a story about the museum's collection and about um, kind of this period of, of work as possible. Obviously we didn't, we're not presenting a complete picture but as complete as we could do. Um, and two, um, it allowed us to, to think about works without any kind of preconceived structure in a way, right? The exhibition was formed without any galleries in mind. And I think that sometimes is something that curators subconsciously do maybe, right? As you're as you're putting together a checklist, you're you're envisioning how it's gonna live in certain spaces because you want the the work to be you know presented in the best way possible and you know your galleries. Well, we didn't have galleries. <laughs> um, and so there was a way in which it allowed us to um, think more freely about um, the works and about the combination of works. Um, and honestly, the institutional framework of the show, um, which um, the Fry is loosely presenting, didn't come about until after a conversation I had with Emma Chubb, um, the curator of modern and contemporary art at the Smith College Museum of Art, um, who was also interested in the institution's history. And she was the one who really said, wouldn't it be interesting if, um, and so that was way down the line, you know, that was after all the venues had been confirmed, that was after the checklist had been set. And um, it then became kind of, a, it was a way in which we also could have conversations within the department about our understanding of art, right? I mean, there, we don't often, I feel like 
in curatorial departments, we don't often talk just about art, right? We're constantly focused on the work that we're doing. And so I got to have a number of amazing conversations with the people in my department, uh, specifically the fellows who work in our, in our department about different artists and different works of art and how they were seeing them and thinking about them. And that led to the two kind of structures that we created, which was the institutional structure and kind of the more thematic structure. Um, it, it was an amazing process, right? Because it didn't, we, we weren't tied to anything. We were kind of untethered, which allowed us to, to think in, in a different way. And also too, knowing that venues could decide not to use them was also something that was like, okay, well then this is how we, you, we imagine presenting it, but you can also do entirely your own thing, which two of the venues actually did. Um, so it, Again, as I said earlier, like it just allowed us, allowed me, I've seen four of the six in person. I've walked through the fry virtually, I'm, uh, you know, on a cart with a camera. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's allowed me to see pairings and, and works of art just completely anew, you know? Um, and that was- yeah, There were cool. even, there were things that jumped out at me that I didn't even fully plan for, you know, that, um, you know, little, uh, echoes and resemblances that were really satisfying um, after it was installed. Yeah, and and that's also the beauty of installation too, right? You don't often see those those conversations until you see them out hung on the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I first saw the exhibition at the Gibbs Museum in South Carolina. Um, speaking of context and how it sort of changes as things shift uh, or move around the country, maybe. Um, and of course, like the image of the Confederate flag that so prominently features in Hank Willis Thomas's Black Righteous Space, you know, it felt really freighted there. Um, you know, and the stars and bars flew over the South Carolina State House until 2015. So yeah. it was, I mean, I saw it there in 2019. So it was very um, raw. Um, and so in Seattle, the symbol is still sort of shocking to see, but it feels a little less freighted. So I just wonder, um, having seen the installation in person in four places or just watching the collection sort of take on different meanings in different contexts, um, what your sort of overall impression is of how it's been received in different places or how it has mean has meant differently in these different contexts. Yeah, I, you know, it's been wonderful to be a fly on the wall and in the in the venues that I did get to go in person to because I got to witness so many conversations happening in front of works, right? And that that is not, I mean, the studio museum is closed, right? Because we're undergoing a major building project, but that is not something that I have observed in, in a long time in terms of people just really engaging with works, wanting to stand in front of them for long periods of time, examining them, look closely at them. Um, and that was that was amazing, right? Because that means then that we did our jobs as curators, right? Our, our teams did their jobs in terms of installing the works in, in a really beautiful way. Um, and so that happened at every venue that I saw. Um, and then in terms of just thinking about some of the, the programming that was that that took place, and I know that the Fry has a suite of amazing programs, um, the conversations that happened there, but also the the expansive expansive uh, expansiveness of um, who was participating in those conversations, right? It's not just artists and art historians, but it's um, you know community activists and um, lawyers and you know, other types of, of professionals who are really engaging with these artists because of the resonance of them, right? Because they speak so broadly and deeply to not just a black experience, but a, a lived experience um, for everyone. And so that was also really special to see. Um, and then I've just been really heartened by the numbers, the audience attendance. Um, we, we've seen, you know, some, some of the institutions have told us that they've seen record-breaking um, numbers um, for their exhibitions. Um, and so to me, that also indicates, um, you know, that, that there is an interest um, and an appetite for these works um, that means that we are doing the job that we are meant to do, right? That we are doing the work um, in a way that, um, you know, we should be doing. So, um, I've been really happy with with the show. I think it's been installed in in um, so beautifully and um, 
in, at every venue thus far. Um, and also so differently too. I, keep, I, I have to keep on emphasizing that point because I've been lucky enough to see it um, at all of these various venues and each venue has such a different take on it. Um, and so I um, am grateful again to you, Amanda, for all of your work. Our, I would also just mentioned that our registrar, Gina, um, also immensely complimented your installation as being one of her <laughs> favorites. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, she loved all of the installations at all of the venues, um, but yours especially. <laughs> You're very diplomatic. Uh, I'll take that compliment. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we have a really great team too. Um, but I, coming back to like the collection at the Studio Museum and you touched on the F shows and, you know, there is a section in the exhibition as installed at the Fry that features works by artists who were included in F shows at the, you know, fictions, flow, freestyle. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about how a uh, institution's exhibition history or exhibition program informs its collection. You know, you're, you become interested in an artist, you get to know them working on an exhibition and then you, you know, seek to add a work to your collection to sort of uh, memorialize the exhibition history in the collection. Uh, is there a way that the collection informs exhibitions? Does it go both ways? Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, you know, one of the, the amazing things about the way that the Studio Museum has worked for a long time is that um, curators have frequently turned to the collection as, as inspiration for um, exhibition ideas. And so there is a long, look, just even looking at the exhibition history at the museum, you see, again, just how, how many um, themes, how many ideas come up from even a handful of works, right? Um, there's been some um, beautiful, um, amazing exhibitions um, that use one or two works from the collection as a jumping off point to explore an idea more deeply. Um, uh, and that I think, again, just speaks to the ways in which these works resonate so deeply across um, all types of, of ways of seeing and understanding. Um, but then too, as you mentioned, it goes backwards as it goes the other way as well. And that uh, our collection is such, has such deep ties to our exhibition history and our institutional history and thinking about the founders of the museum and the, and the artists who were so involved um, in, the early, in the early years of the museum. Um, and so that has been, there's been a great synergy in, think, in terms of thinking about the collection as a representation of the overall work that the institution is involved in. Well, and I understand that your collection strategy um, includes adding at least one work by each of the resident artists. Um, so I don't know, is, um, I, I guess I'm interested, like it's such a, a privilege to be a collection curator, like working with artists in the studio, in the museum. So you get like a really intimate understanding of their process and these specific objects, some of them must be made there on site. The studios are like in at the core of the museum, right? Yeah. Um, so are there, I don't know, do you have anecdotes about like certain works that you've like watched be created and then they enter the collection? <laughs> well, I mean, one of the great um, things about, as you mentioned, the our acquisition strategy is that we are able, um, whenever possible, to acquire at least one work by an by every artist in residence, and that has happened over the last, I would say, fifteen or twenty years. Um, so we do have um, some artists who are missing from earlier on in in the program's history. Um, but it's amazing to to think about again the site specificity of all of this. Um, in that. Um, we are, you know, the, the, the works in the collection are part of our exhibition history. They're part of the artist in residence program. They're part of the institutional history. So, so the deep connections that exist are really amazing. Um, and I have to say, I, when I didn't, I don't, I try not to bother the artist in residence because I do want them to have their time. But the times that I've been able to peek into their studios, it's been amazing to see the trajectory of their practice from, you know, the, the first months of their time in the, in the residency and then all of the work that they're able to produce um, in just a short 10 or 11 months, you know? So that I think is, is a beautiful um, 
aspect of working at the Studio Museum because it's not often that we're, we're allowed that opportunity to see an artist in, in the midst of their practice um, developing their work. And so that again ties to the museum's mission and being an artist-driven institution and having the studio in our name um, in a way that um, really speaks um, uh, and resonates to all the work that we're doing. I know we're getting towards the end here, and I think the last question that I want to ask before I check on the uh, any questions in the chat is, uh, I mean, I met, you must be deep in planning for the installation of the new building. And so I don't know, is there any like preview you can give us of how you're approaching that? Or I mean, are there new commissions for the building that the museum is doing or? I don't know if I can divulge any of that mm -hmm. uh, as my my boss, I think, is, is watching. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will say that all of the work from Black Refractions in terms of all of the thinking around the conceptualization of um, has been amazing um, in terms of allowing me to think about what will be in the new building or envisioning how the collection can live in the new building, right? Um, it's a space that I'm not familiar with. I don't, I don't, I, it doesn't exist yet. It exists on paper and in, in, you know, schematic drawings. Um, and so the possibilities, right. And, and seeing how even with, within the hundred or so works that are in black refractions and the possibilities of their display and interpretation and understanding at each of the venues is so exciting, right. And in, in thinking about how that will translate into the new building with, the first purpose-built uh, facility for this in the Studio Museum's history, right? We've never had a building that was built expressly as as a museum, and so um, that is exciting. When I don't think about all the work that is involved to get to that place of install, um, but you will have to come to New York when the building opens in a few years. It's a few years now because I know your website says construction is ongoing through 2021. So I wasn't sure what the completion date was estimated as, you know, it's New York construction, I guess it's always a moving target. Yeah, um, I believe, I don't know if we had a camera on the building and you could you could kind of see the process of construction. I don't know if that's still up, but um, it's it, it's a fascinating watch, almost as good as the, as the giant pandas. Uh-oh, it says, my connection is slow. Okay. Hmm. Um, okay. I don't know that we've received any questions. Alex, can you let me know in the chat if there are any questions from the audience that have come in? No questions. Okay. Well, with that then, um, thank you so much, Connie. Thank you. Great. I, I'm sure you've um, been through all this information many times at this juncture, but keeping it fresh. Definitely. Um, I'll turn it over to Alex then to close out the evening and um, hope to talk to you soon, Connie. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined tonight. Thank you so much, Amanda and Connie, for that wonderful conversation. Um, and also thank you to everyone who presented tonight. Black Refractions opens tomorrow, May 22nd at the Fry Art Museum. And I encourage you all to visit during the run of show through August 15th. You can reserve your tickets um, on our website at frymuseum.org and admission is always free. The website also has information about programs related to the exhibition, including our virtual community day with activities for all ages, including art making, musical performances, and a cooking demonstration on Saturday, June 5th, a virtual curator talk with Connie Choi and Amanda Donnan on June 23rd, and a special virtual event for our FRI members, a curatorial conversation with the Studio Museum's Thelma Golden and the FRI director, um, Joseph Rosa, on June 17th. We are honored to present this landmark exhibition and couldn't do it without the generous support of our members and donors. You can learn more about becoming a member and supporting the FRI on our website at the links in the chat. Once again, thank you all for joining us tonight and we will see you at the museum. <laughs>